having more and more problems with uh, farmers dying in grain bins. And I think that's happening uh, for, for a variety of reasons. Number one, the bins are getting bigger. You know, we're building uh, some pretty good sized bins anymore. And on the commercial side, we're building bins 105 foot diameter, 132, 155 foot, up to 1.4 million bushels in one bin. So we're building some pretty big bins anymore. And we're building much bigger conveyors. We're not moving the grain of four inch augers anymore. And uh, we're growing a lot more corn. Uh, 60 to 70 percent of the, of the entrapments we have in bins happen with corn. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And of course, uh, the U.S., uh, you know, we're pushing like 15 billion bushels of corn production anymore. So there's just a lot more corn being grown. Uh, there's chemical issues on the farm. Uh, you know, you got power lines, and, uh, and, and that gets to be somewhat problematic around grain bins, especially if people are moving conveyors around and things like that. Uh, heavy machinery. Half the fatalities on farms, uh, unfortunately, involve machinery and equipment. A good share of them are tractor rollovers, people getting caught up in combines, wrapped around um, PTOs, um, augers, just a lot of different entanglement kind of issues. Um, we have special classes just teaching firefighters how to cut somebody out of an auger because of some of the you know, d unique designs of augers and, and how they might spring back at you depending on the design of the auger and stuff. Large animal issues, uh, manure pits. We have a surprising number of farmers um, around the Midwest that are dying around the manure pits. And you know, we're getting uh, pretty big confined uh, feeding operations and, and of course those manure pits are going to give off, you know, methane and hydrogen sulfide and so we're seeing deaths in some of those kind of areas. So anyway, um, there's a variety of things that are happening on the farm and, uh, and we find that a lot of times, uh, especially if the local vol the volunteer fire department doesn't have anybody on the department that grew up on a farm, they may not understand how to deal with some of these issues. And so we're actually trying to create a hotline in, uh, in the U.S. so that if somebody has to go and rescue somebody on a farm, they can call that hotline and get some real quick do's and don'ts. You know, what are some things I should know? What are some things I should look at? Those kind of things. Um, this uh, six-page flyer that you see, uh, I would encourage you to, to go to this website, Grain Entrapment Prevention. If you go to that website, what you'll see is this right here, this home page will pop up in your screen. And below that will be 14 or 15 section titles. And there are live links that you can open up and view all sorts of uh, PowerPoints and some live um, videos and interviews and stuff with people uh, dealing with grain entrapments. And so what I'd like to do uh, for the balance of this hour is just share some thoughts about grain storage, uh, aeration systems, what we're seeing with numbers, some emergency rescue type of equipment and some kind of a uh, safety equipment you might want to think about having on the farm. But um, uh, we'll talk about these seven uh, best management practices a little bit. Uh, one of the things we, if you open this up, it kind of goes through some thoughts on these seven best management practices. And one of the things we keep encouraging everybody is, is to develop kind of what we call a, a zero uh, entry mentality. Let's design these facilities so people uh, are not tempted to go into the bin. If at all possible, Let's do a better job of, uh, you know, conditioning the grain and uh, so you're not tempted to go in there. Let's build reclaim systems that are not going to plug. Let's have better holes in those floors, uh, better augers, uh, better reclaim systems to get the grain out. So again, uh, somebody's not going to be tempted to get in there and try to unplug the system and get themselves into trouble. We're working with um, all the steel bend companies in North America, uh, including West Steel out of Winnipeg, uh, uh, Sue Cup here, uh, and I know Charlie Sue Cup and, and uh, a lot of the other steel bend companies, but we're working with the eight steel bend companies that probably build 95% of the, of the grain bends in, in North America. And we're talking about things like access points, doors, work platforms, things like that. Uh, that number two item, never work alone. Um, I know that's easier said than done uh, on a farm. On commercial operations, if, if, if an operator sends an employee into that bend and there's nobody outside that bend working with him, you can get fined pretty heavily by OSHA in the U.S., and I'm sure the Ministry of Labor is kind of taking that same position here. But um, we want people to work together in a buddy kind of system. Uh, the number third item, never enter uh, unless you're trained. We want to make sure that we're sending somebody into that bin. They understand what the hazards are, how to deal with the hazards and mitigate those hazards, and how to get themselves out of trouble if they have to. Um, um, using a permit, I know that's not going to happen on a farm, but in a commercial operation, uh, we want the operators to use a, a checklist and it's just a very simple thing to go down this checklist and make sure they didn't uh, omit something. 
And it's no different than if you a flight plan, if you're trying to take off of an aircraft, you know, you have to go through a checklist. And we're trying to use the same kind of checklist when you're working around grain operations to make sure you don't uh, take any uh, unnecessary uh, shortcuts. Um, the fifth item, lockout tagout. I understand there's a speaker touching about on that today, um, so I won't get into that. Um, securing the lifeline. We want anybody that's going to go into a bend and walk on grain to have a harness on and a lifeline. And, um, uh, and that's, that's pretty critical depending on what type of uh, you know, bend you're getting into and how much grain's in that bend. But we want that lifeline secured properly. And if I have a little time, maybe over lunch, I'll demonstrate uh, that bend entry kit that's laying on the ground there and how that works. We want somebody to wear a lifeline, and we want that lifeline secured. If you have somebody, in fact, outside with the other end of that lifeline, is that person prepared if they get an 800-pound jerk in that rope? You know, and we want to make sure that they understand how to deal with that and how to keep slack out of the lifeline and all those good things. The inside of this uh, flyer just shares a bunch of numbers in terms of how frequently some of these things are happening. We're actually um, seeing more grain entrapments in the last seven years uh, actually about three times as many every year than we used to back in the 80s and 90s because of some of the reasons I mentioned earlier. In uh, 2010, we actually buried an average of one person in a grain bin every week for the whole year, and half of them didn't come out alive. Um, in this last week alone, we buried two guys out in Iowa, and uh, one guy survived and the other one did not. Um, I was telling some of the firefighters here earlier, the, the, the gentleman that survived was really lucky. He was a 23-year-old man. He was walking across the crust in, in a corn bin, 80,000 bushel corn bin, and he didn't know that there was a, a void pocket underneath the crust. And he was poking the crust with an 8-foot PVC pipe, and the crust broke, and he, and he went down through this crust, and then the corn came down on top of him, and in a matter of about two seconds, he was buried underneath two foot of corn. And the only thing that was through the surface was his hand. But he was completely buried in the corn, and the only reason he survived was the guy has an asthmatic condition, so he was wearing a full face helmet with a powered uh, ventilator, and it kept him alive for about 20 minutes until the firefighters managed to get to him, and they could see where he was because his hand was still poking through the surface. And the firefighters were trained and had the right equipment to get him out of there in time before he died. But those are two instances we had in, in Iowa in the last 10 days alone, and we've had two cases in Michigan you know, since uh, January 1. So we're seeing more and more of these kind of uh, you know, issues, unfortunately, and we're trying to encourage everybody to, to have some familiarity and, and know how to deal with this stuff. But back in uh, 1908, uh, Butler built the first steel bins, and they were 12-foot steel bins, and they used the same material. They were building water troughs, and they started building uh, you know, grain bins. And since then, we've had about 25 different companies come and go that have been building grain bins, and I think the way things are going will probably be down to about five... Uh, steel bend companies that are going to be left uh, in the next uh, you know, five to seven years because of some of the economic uh, pressures and a few other things. But I would encourage you guys, if you're dealing with a, with a steel bend company, if they're not willing to talk to you seriously about some of the issues we're going to talk about here in the next half hour, uh, you ought to go down the road and go to a different steel bend company. I mean, if they're not interested in your family's safety, then you ought to be going somewhere else. But we've seen a lot of companies come and go. Uh, these particular 80-foot uh, butlers were built back in the, you know, around 1970, and they just have a, a one hole in the center, uh, and it's a 14-inch hole. And when that hole plugs, you know, the operators are forced to do some crazy things, and you know, like jumping in the bin and walking around in the green that's not in very good condition. Or they'll punch, a, I don't know if you can see this very well, but they'll punch a small auger into the sidewall and try to empty that bin and, uh, you know, do some of those kind of things. Um, the other thing we're doing is, is trying to... Um, tell everybody to use better doors. We want to get away from these 24-inch uh, round portal doors and, and, and go into a, a better uh, walk-in door. You've got a pretty decent door on the side of these souk-up bends that you can get in. But we want to put in better doors that you can get into. And we want to have a, a, a decent platform. You know, if you have elevated bends, a lot of the commercial bends, the bigger bends that we're building, are elevated four or five feet, and they have a tunnel underneath. Well, if, if you're in those kind of situations, we want a platform that you can stand on with a rail around it not a simple 18-inch step. The Star of the West, unfortunately, had an incident three years ago. We put up a new bin, and a young man was um, <clears throat> trying to get into one of the bins on the second shift during harvest, and he slipped and fell backwards off the step and broke his neck, and he's uh, permanently disabled as a result of that. So we want decent uh, platforms and, and handrails when you're working around some of these structures and ladders inside these bins. Uh, when it comes to the top access holes, 
We want bigger uh, doors up on top. These are pretty restricted. If you try to get rescue equipment, and I'm sure the firefighters can uh, uh, you know, speak to this, but you try to get a Stokes basket or any kind of rescue equipment in some of these, these, these openings are pretty limited. And unfortunately, you've got a lot of obstructions like ladders and uh, wind rings and all sorts of things. And when you try to get somebody in and out of these openings, and so we want to change uh, the design of some of these things. Um, I'll come back to this topic here, but there's a lot of different types of cofferdams that are on the market now. Uh, there's probably about seven of them that we've been working with and, and testing and, and uh, looking at the virtues of one versus the other. And uh, they run in uh, price anything from $600 to $4,000. I mean, <laughs> unfortunately, a lot of these aren't, they're not giving them away. Um, but there's a lot of different types of rescue tubes that are, that are available you know, on the market. Uh, we're seeing a lot of uh, wood as well as uh, aluminum. Um, and uh, some of these uh, wood types are pretty good. And then also this uh, uh, aluminum one here that... Uh, the, these guys, the firefighters are going to demonstrate to you folks. We bought one of these, or actually two of them, from that 4-H group um, out of uh, Sarnia uh, a couple years ago. And it's a pretty uh, interesting design. But, uh, but when you get somebody buried in the grain, uh, if, the, if the grain is up to their chest, there's going to be probably, if, if you took a, a wristlets and put it around that uh, victim, or in this case this firefighter, and tried to yank them out of that grain, you're going to have to exert eight, nine hundred pounds of force to pull that person out. Now you can imagine if somebody's pulling on your arms and using eight to nine hundred pounds of force, what that's going to do, you know, with your arm socket or vertebrae in your back or whatever, but you're going to have to build some kind of a structure around them and then dig the grain out between um, the victim and, um, and we just tr played around this uh, triangle uh, design here where you actually build a, a triangle out of plywood and uh, uh, put a kind of a flange here that made a pretty simple uh, type of thing. Um, the other thing that this works, you know, nine times out of ten, if you get into a bin and you're trying to get to the victim, you're coming into this top access hole, and the victim is over here on the other side of the bin, and the grain is sloped down to him. So if the grain is up to his neck and you're trying to get to him, the last thing you want to do is walk down at him and cause that grain to avalanche a little further and bury him further. So if you can get around him and walk around the outside perimeter of the wall, or build this kind of a V above him so any grain that's going down will be deflected around him and buy a little bit more time. But anything you can do to, you know, uh, stabilize the situation. And here's some wooden uh, uh, coffer dams with just some holes punched in the side and some rope lashing to keep the, the boards together. Um, this is a unit they call the Aspen Lift. It's a very light unit. It folds and uh, a firefighter can carry it up to the top of the bin on his back, get up there, uh, open it up, and then uh, uh, secure it, tie it off, and pull. And there's enough pulleys up here, and it's and structurally sound enough that you can pull the victim and, and rescuer out of the bend together if you have to. But that's uh, something that we're playing around with because it's very difficult to get some, somebody that's you know, immobile out of some of these bends, and there's no hook above you. There's no sky anchor to use, and so how do you how do you do that? So we're playing around with different techniques to do that. Uh, I've got a, an example of this Ben Entry Kit, which if anybody wants to see it during lunch, I'd be happy to show you how it works. But here Mike is, uh, is manning uh, the, the other end of this, which is secured, in this case, around the stiffener. And I'm uh, kind of uh, illustrating walking around grain. But this system is designed so these little 8 millimeter prussic cords will lock. If something happens and you start sinking in the grain or, or punch through a crust, that will uh, automatically lock and stabilize you until help arrives. And so we're trying to sell these little simple rope kits to... Uh, farm families too that they might use um, in getting in and out of bins. We started playing around with these uh, not passing pulleys back in 2008. Uh, I'll come back to that, but we actually secure this underneath um, uh, the compression ring or one of the, press, uh, the purlins, and then you have a little uh, tag line that goes to the outside side hole that you can t uh, tag in your um, lifeline and pull it on up through that not passing pulley. And you can buy these for about 700, uh, 70 bucks, I should say. And uh, we're, we're trying to encourage people to look at something like that or something that you can secure your lifeline to. Most of the problems we have with grain entrapment um, happen in steel bends. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. Um, uh, first of all, in a steel bend, the bottoms tend to be flat, whereas uh, most of the wood and the concrete bends we're working in, you're working with a sloped uh, floor. Um, also, the, the convection currents that are generated in the bins, the R factor is a little bit different when you're working with wood 
or concrete, uh, you've got more uh, convection currents in a steel bend. The R, the R factors are just different. So you tend to see more spoilage uh, in grain in a steel bend than you do in a, in a, in a concrete bend or of another type of structure. Uh, most of the farm bends, of course, uh, I think are probably in that 24 to 40 foot range. The commercial bends, though, we're getting into you know, 80, uh, 90, 105 footers. Is a 105 foot bend is a very common bend around the Midwest anymore. And depending on the eave height, you're getting uh, somewhere around 650 to 700,000 bushels in there. And of course, they're even going bigger now with uh, up to 132 foot and 155 foot diameter bends. But when that center hole stops flowing, if, that, if you can see that center hole, 10, 10 to 12 percent of that grain is still going to be in that bend. So in a 105 foot bend, you could still have 100, over 100,000 bushels in that bend. And when somebody starts walking, gets in from the side and starts walking down this surface, you know, you're asking for trouble if you're not tied off. Now, most of the smaller uh, farm bends, I think most of the farmers are getting in from the top, but in these kind of large commercial bends, the guys are tending to get into the side and, um, and clean out the bend and, and finish out um, the, the process. But uh, one of the things we're trying to encourage um, is larger discharge sump holes. Get away from the 12 foot uh, or 12 inch squares and, and move into the 24 inch squares or bigger. Depending on the size bend you're putting in, or the site type of conveyors and what have you, we really want um, a bigger discharge sump holes and, and smaller interme intermediates strung out about every eight feet uh, to the wall. And then a better uh, sweep auger on top of that so the, so the system, the reclaim system doesn't plug. Now generally we'll leave these holes open, but once, the, once those holes are open and somebody goes in there and repositions the sweep or does some of that kind of stuff, then we like to see them go in there and drop some kind of grading in there so the, uh, the employee cannot step through that opening. Most of the problems we see with augers is somebody stepping through the floor and the auger taking their, their leg off right below the kneecap. I put on a training session five years ago out in the East Coast in Maryland and there's a small country elevator about the size of what we have here today and two of the employees were walking around with prosthetic legs. They both lost their legs in, in the same bend and I'm thinking, boy, what does it take to get the point here, you know? Uh, <clears throat> but we, we want to see bigger holes in these bends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's about it. Uh, if I had more time, I'd talk a little bit more about uh, harnesses. We want people to look at better harnesses, to look at a rescue class 3 harness instead of a simple uh, industrial harness for, for a lot of reasons. But um, uh, we want people to look at uh, other standards besides what M uh, Ministry of Labor might be telling you or OSHA in the U.S. Uh, some of these other standards, the NFPA and ANSI and some of these others, there's a lot of good information that you can garner if you read some of those voluntary standards um, and how they apply to you. But um, when it comes to design parameters, um, we're currently working with all the steel bend companies and the American Society of Ag and the Biological Engineers, and we're working on a, on a design um, uh, system right now called X624, and it's going to be voted on in Kansas City here at the end of this month. But what the design parameter calls for is anybody building new steel bends in the future, we want uh, bigger uh, discharge uh, holes and uh, spacing, uh, they're spaced fairly close together. And, uh, and of course, when you get into the bigger bends, like the 80, 90, 105 foot bends where you're building tunnels underneath, we really want to encourage them to use a 7x7 seven seven, uh, walkway on, in those tunnels so we can put uh, appropriate transitions and inspection holes and things like that. And of course, safer, more efficient sweep augers. Access doors, you want better um, and um, designs and bigger doors to get in, not only to the top, but the sides. Ladders, work platforms, um, we really need better work platforms. The ladders on most of the, the industrial bends, if you put up a, the average steel bend that's 80, 90 foot diameter, and you run a few cycles of corn through it, within a few years, the ladders will be pressed against the wall because they're not built sturdy enough to take those kind of pressures. And so, you know, we want ladders that are built better. Um, the restraint systems, I could spend an hour talking about, and we're going to have a lot of classes in the future, when you talk about restraint systems, fall arrest, work positioning, and fall protection, a lot of people don't understand the distinctions between them. And when you're dealing with somebody like OSHA or the Ministry of Labor, uh, we don't want to be talking about fall protection when you're in the bend. We want to talk about fall restraint, and the requirements are entirely different. We want to make sure that people are using the lifelines and they're controlling the lifelines and keeping the slack out of the lifelines and have them secured so that uh, if something happens, they'll lock and, and, uh, 
And again, we want you know different design doors, bigger doors to, to facilitate uh, safer uh, entry into these bins. Um, the other thing I want you to think about, if you have three or four bins and a conveyor going across the top, usually from peak to peak to peak, the top uh, access holes are, are generally going to be over here 90 degrees from this conveyor. Now you picture somebody in that bin that you got to get out of there on a, on, a, on a stoke or a skid or LSP. If that person is uh, immobile, maybe they had a heart attack or a stroke or they fell and, and, and uh, broken back or whatever, but you've got somebody strapped to a board and you're trying to get them out of this and there's nothing up above you, it's going to take you an extra 45 minutes to get that victim out, uh, depending how competent you are and how comfortable you are with certain high angle rescue techniques. We're trying to encourage everybody to, to put the holes over here somewhere underneath, uh, just off center a little bit, a few degrees off so you can come up alongside this conveyor. But put, it, put the holes over here so if something ever happened, you could drop a rope down from this top conveyor right down into that hole and you're going to save yourself at least a half hour to 45 minutes trying to get that victim out if you have to. And the other thing you have to keep in mind is there's a lot of sharp edges around these bins. You put 300 pounds on the end of a rope, half inch rope, and you rub that rope up against a sharp edge <laughs> and you're going to have a problem. You know, so we want edge protection, we want clear shots of some of this stuff. And Dr. Uh, Carol Jones, um, I work very closely with, with Carol out of Oklahoma State University and, and a gentleman by the name of Davis Hill out of Penn State University. And uh, we're all three of us are going to be over at Blythe um, doing that three-day training session, but we share a lot of PowerPoints back and forth together. Uh, but this is the, the Ag Research Station at Stillwater, Oklahoma, where Carol and her staff does a lot of testing of some of these um, things that I'm uh, sharing with you and, and uh, things you want to promote in the future. But when you produce a crop, you know, you got a lot of resources tied up in that crop. And it's always amazing to me how a, a farm family or even an elevator operator will take a crop in, put it in a bin, and then forget about it. You know, they, they, they forget about checking the temperatures and they, and they just forget about it. And you got a lot of money tied up in, the, in those bins. And you, so we need to think about, um, you know, maintaining the quality that's there. And of course, if you're sending um, anybody into that bin, whether it's an employee or other family member, um, you know, let's, let's, let's think about some of the ramifications when it comes to safety. 20% of the farm uh, members that we see that die are under the age of 18 years old. And we see a lot of 14, 15 year old kids dying in grain bins because you know dad sent them in the bin and went out in the field and, and aren't aware of some of these things that can happen and, and we see a lot of um, you know kids uh, dying in some of these areas too. Of course um, the grain you put in that bin this fall or this, this wheat harvest uh, uh, is not going to get any better. It's never going to be any better than the day you harvested it. It's just going to continue to deteriorate and hopefully we can uh, minimize the amount of deterioration and spoilage and by some of the things we're doing and sometimes we do try to do some blending whether it's sprout or heat damage or something else, we try to do some blending, but it's only going to get worse, uh, the condition uh, and the quality of that grain as time goes on. And these are not good pictures, and you don't want any of these kind of situations where, where you're bringing the grain out and it's, and it's in those kind of uh, spoiled conditions. Convection currents. As most of you know, when the differential in temperature between the grain and the outside ambient air is greater than 15 degrees Fahrenheit or 8 to 10 degrees centigrade, there's going to be convection currents going in that bin. And, and, and it's amazing, you get into these huge bins, uh, how strong some of those convection currents are. I mean, it's like you're standing outside and you say, where's this wind coming from? But you're actually going to have convection currents going on in those bins, and, um, and those bins are going to sweat. And what we're seeing, especially in these big bins, is we're not paying enough attention to the airflows. Uh, particularly to the vents up above. Everybody wants to talk about the fan on the, on the ground level, but nobody talks about the vents up above and how critical it is to keep some air moving underneath those roofs. Um, I'll come back to that, but uh, of course the imbalance of moistures in these bins, <clears throat> depending on how you're, um, what kind of controls you have with the drying operation, we see too many bins where there's six, seven degree, uh, percent differentials in moisture. You know, everything from 12 to 19 moisture pockets in those bins because the people weren't monitoring the drying operation as closely as they should be. And uh, of course you don't want too much moisture and, uh, and the same token you don't want 12 percent corn going in there either and, and losing all that weight and, and uh, material. Stress cracks, if we're not drying the corn very well you're going to end up with a lot more stress cracks depending on what kind of temperatures you're using and what kind of dryer you have. And, and after you elevate that, that corn um, you know, four or five times you're going to see a lot more uh, FM 
Uh, insect issues, of course, play a part. We're seeing more and more insects that are um, resistant to things like phosphine and other fumigants. We're seeing that that's becoming more prevalent. But uh, as the temperatures cool this fall, you know, that air on the outside is going to settle on the, down the outside of the bends and force the, the warmer, moist air up the center. And that's where you'll start seeing the initial um, spoilage start to take place if you're not moving the air around those bends like you should. And you should be checking the temperatures in those bends, um, <clears throat> preferably a couple times a week, but as a minimum, once a week. I'm amazed at, you know, uh, people I talk to that haven't checked the temperatures in those bends for four, six, eight weeks. And I'm saying, <laughs> what are you thinking? You know, how many dollars do you have in those bends? And you ought to be checking those bends, uh, you know, the temperatures uh, weekly. And when you start to see that temperature move, even if it's only one or two degrees a week, there's something going on in that bend. One of these things is going on in that bend, and you, you need to focus on that and determine what's happening and what do you, do you have to do to control it. Um, so there's a lot of reasons for grain spoilage, including the, the structure itself. You know, uh, uh, does the structure have any holes and cracks and spouting and, you know, vents and whatever? Do you have some issues? I mean, um, it's amazing. You know, I go around the country and... And, uh, and you check even the bolts uh, where those stiffeners are to the foundation. You'd be surprised how many nuts you go up to on those bolts, and you can actually turn uh, the nuts with your hand. <laughs> they were never secured uh, properly and tightened down. And, and, uh, um, but you got a lot of equilibrium type situations between the temperature and, and, uh, and the moisture in those bins. And, um, this, uh, this uh, booklet uh, Lindsay uh, lent me here from the Pioneers is a great uh, booklet in here and shows some of these tables about some of these equilibrium conditions and how long the grain will, will keep. Um, uh, there's a lot of steel bend companies that crank out some of these uh, type of booklets. This is one from Balin, uh, but Sukup and um, GSI and a lot of the companies, uh, West Steel, have some of these booklets. But you need to understand these charts and uh, looking at the temperatures and moistures how long can you safely keep that grain? Um, <clears throat> what are those equilibrium type uh, conditions that you need to be sensitive to? And uh, as I said earlier, one thing we don't talk enough about is roof vents. What kind of vents should you have? How should they be sized? How important is it to keep mo air moving underneath the roof of those bins? Um, also keeping the, keeping the grain clean and all the handling equipment, not only the, you know, the, the combine, uh, but the vehicles you're using and, and everything else. This is going to get to be more and more critical <clears throat> in the next five to seven years, not only from a grain conditioning point of view, but from a grain safety point of view and quality point of view. Um, anybody that's dealing in the U.S., we're going through, we're looking at FSMA right now, uh, and we're also, a lot of the food processors are getting um, certified under the new, um, well, it's not new, but a lot of food processors are starting to get serious about it, the Global Food Safety Initiative, which is basically an ISO type process. But as the, all these processing companies get more serious about these food safety and quality issues, there's going to be more and more pressure on you folks at the farm level to step up to some of these same kind of requirements. And I don't have time to get into that today, but you're going to hear a lot more about that in, in, in the years ahead and what that means to your farm operation. But the last thing you want is, is facilities like this. You know, your facilities need to be clean going into harvest. If they're not, you're just asking for trouble, um, whether it's mold, insect, rodents, whatever, you're just asking for trouble. And you need to clean the facilities. <clears throat> we need to look at some residual sprays uh, for insects. Uh, you know, we need to look at rodent control, but we need to look at all these kind of things. Um, this, um, and the other thing that tends to happen, <laughs> everybody gets pushed for um, space as they're trying to complete the harvest. And uh, so we fill the bins right up to the peak. And of course, the angle repose of grain, uh, if you're working with corn, that's you know, the harvest moistures, you're probably looking at 21 degree angle repose, which kind of matches the pitch of the roof. So everybody tends to want to fill that bin right up to the peak of that, that bin. And well, that's fine, but when the harvest is over, you better get that grain flattened out and leveled with the ease. And for a lot of reasons, when you want to run that air condition, that air um, uh, fan system and stuff, you don't want that grain stacked uh, to the peak. Um, I'll share a quick story with you. We, we put on this training session in uh, Frankenmuth uh, the third week of June every year. And we get people coming in from all over uh, the United States and Canada. We have people from Winnipeg. Uh, but uh, this gentleman was telling me um, about something he did, and he still gets nightmares about it. But he worked for an elevator, 
and the elevator was a small elevator and they were kind of landlocked in the middle of town. So they built some storage bins about five miles out of town in a, on a remote location. They'd fill the bins and there was never anybody there until maybe six, eight months later and they'd send two guys out there to empty the bins. Well, after they filled this particular bin uh, for the first time at Weed Harvest, this guy went out there and I don't know, I think he was trying to check the, the way the temperature cables were mounted. He, he, went in, he wanted to get into this bin to, to basically check the underside of this cone. He drives out there, didn't tell anybody he was going, and he gets out there and crawls into this access hole, and there's about a two foot uh, space here, and he's crawling on his hands and knees between the wheat and the roof, and he gets about halfway up and he just hears something, he turns around, and the, and the wheat had filled in this pocket behind him. Now picture that, you're underneath the roof, it's 130 degrees, you know, it's a hot day, the end of July, and you just, you just buried yourself in that bin, because that, that cab, that, <laughs> that opening just plugged up on you. And he got himself turned around and spent the next hour trying to dig himself out of there. And he said he still has nightmares <laughs> about that. But those are some of the dumb things we do and don't think about it, you know, and, and they can really get you into trouble. Um, as I said, you want to core out this bin and then level the top. Uh, you want those, um, you know, those pockets of FM eliminated and you want, um, you know, the, uh, an even static pressure in that bin. You know, this is going to be a lot higher static pressure than the outside of that bin, and so you're the aeration system is not going to work the way it should. So you want to level off that bin. Um, we want to put more air through that bin uh, than typically is, is the case. A lot of times an engineer might come up and say, well, we're going to give you one-tenth CFM. And that might look good on the surface, but uh, usually five, six years later, you're not getting one-tenth. You know, if you're not maintaining your system and depending on who, who put the aeration system in and, and uh, what kind of elbows you're dealing with and how the sheet metal fits and, and everything else, you're, you're usually going to have a lot less than one-tenth, you know, four or five, six years down the road. So we encourage everybody to look at putting in uh, more uh, CFM than one-tenth. Uh, sometimes universities will talk about uh, as much as a half to one full CFM per bushel. Well, that might be fine at the university level, but not too practical in most of our commercial operations. When you look at the size of the ducts that would be required and the kind of horsepower, <laughs> I mean, it's not, it's not real realistic. But, but you ought to consider more than one-tenth CFM. Uh, when you look at the cooling time, of course, uh, uh, at one tenth CFM, you're, you're probably looking at uh, you know six, seven days of, uh, of cooling time. And if you can move that up to two tenths CFM, you probably cut that down to about three days uh, of cooling time to, to cool that bend down. So uh, you know, look at uh, you know two to three tenths uh, CFM, and, and don't just uh, stop at one tenth. Um, the other thing that most of us feel, and some of us like to argue with the universities on this, but if, if, you're, if you start those fans and you start moving that front through that grain, especially if you have big differentials in moistures and stuff like that, uh, don't get hung up about shutting the fan off like this morning. You know, we had a nice little shower go through. Don't worry about it. Leave the fans on and push that front all the way through. Don't stop it for a day and a half or two days and then go back out and start it again. You're, that grain is not uh, going to pick up moisture very readily. If you look at some of those charts, you're going to have to have an extremely high relative humidity for a number of days before that grain is going to pick up moisture. I mean, I, I, we'd be more concerned about keeping that front going and getting that front through the entire grain mass and doing it fairly quickly and efficiently. Um, <clears throat> the other thing you need to look at is, is vents. Most of the bins we're putting up don't have enough vents. We're not maintaining the vents, especially large bins. We start putting up 80, 90, 105 foot bins. Uh, we're not providing enough air moving underneath those roofs. Um, so when you look at the sizing of some of these bins, um, uh, depending on how many vents you've got, but like in this example, if, if it's a 66,000 uh, bushel bin and you're trying to, you know, uh, and you're working with this kind of a uh, vent over here or this mushroom vent uh, over there on the right, uh, uh, and you're looking at roughly about 1.3 uh, square feet per vent, you're really going to want it to see uh, probably somewhere in around uh, uh, six vents up there on top. And, uh, and in the larger commercial operations, um, we're going to want to put a, a powered uh, uh, vent here and the mushroom vents down in the lower uh, area and then um, pull the air in and, and, and keep some air moving underneath these roofs, even if that, uh, your aeration fan is not running but periodically go out there and move some of that air underneath that roof, especially if you've got some big temperature differentials so that roof doesn't sweat uh, on you. And we want those fans 
uh, and, and that vent uh, square, when you look at the square footage involved, you want to have about 25% more capacity than this system is designed for. You really want to have excess capacity on the roof and you want that air moving underneath the roofs. Of course, insect uh, issues, uh, if you can cool the grain down and keep it below uh, you know, 50 degrees, you're going you're gonna to hopefully uh, stall off uh, some of the insect activity, but you need to monitor the bends and you need to monitor it uh, more religiously than most of us do. And you need to be aware that um, when you do have some of these moisture temperature differentials, you're going to have some bridging and avalanches uh, formed in those bends. And uh, you know, you don't, you want to avoid that type of thing if at all possible. Um, touching base on the cofferdams for a couple minutes, and I know you're going to have a little demonstration here at, uh, over lunch or whatever. But again, as I said, um, you need to get the cofferdams down and you need to remove that grain between the victim and the, and the cofferdam in most cases before you can safely pull that victim out of the grain. So don't try to, you know, get a rope around that person and yank them out. Um, take a little time to, especially if, you, if, if his head's above the grain, take a little time to, you know, get a, some kind of rescue tube to build around them. Uh, we've actually tested about uh, uh, six or seven different types of coffer dams, including the, the aluminum one you have out here from uh, Lambton uh, 4-H. Uh, um, I don't know, did you guys buy the one from Lambton or did you buy it from somebody else? or? Uh, 4-H, yeah. Yeah, I think, I think they're still selling them for like a $1,000 donation or something. Is that what they're at, yeah. roughly? Yeah. So there's quite a few, a variety of uh, coffer dams out there. You know, you see a variety of wood ones. Uh, this is one that we developed in, in Frankenmuth. Um, <clears throat> it's actually made out of Baltic birch plywood. And the, and the pieces just slide together. There's no pins, no chains, no nothing. Um, these are, are both uh, aluminum here, a uh, five or six foot, uh, and these actually come in four, five, six foot, uh, I should say, sections. The thing you got to be careful of, too, is some of these, um, are they small enough that you can actually get it through the opening? We've had some people buy some rescue equipment uh, thinking they're all set to go if something ever happens, but they never took it up top to see if it'd go through the opening. <laughs> you know, you got some pretty uh, tight restrictions of what you can throw through those openings up on top. And then, of course, you have the one here from the Lambton uh, 4-H group uh, that was a nice design. So we're trying to work with, uh, with the firefighters in our local communities and, and we sure appreciate uh, everything they, they uh, do for us and we uh, like to work with them in putting on uh, more, um, you know, more training meetings and involving the farm families too to get involved in some of those things so they can actually see what's involved. If, if you bury somebody in a tank like that, um, it's a very labor, um, time intensive kind of thing. If you see, uh, on the, uh, if you see a, a news alert on the internet where somebody was buried in a grain bin, usually the comment is that three or four fire departments converged on the scene and 30 or 40 guys spent four or five hours trying to get the person out. And, and that's very common, especially if they're not uh, very familiar with the techniques and have the right equipment. And so we, we're trying to work more effectively together and, and talking about um, some of these ag-related incidents that you see in the back of your sheet there. Um, but we just have way too many farm, uh, farmers dying. Uh, you know, it, farming is, is probably one of the most hazardous occupations there is. You know, next to, uh, it's right up there with construction and uh, mining and commercial fishing, but we, we lose more farmers per thousand uh, uh, than any other occupation in the United States. And we're trying to slow that down, and, and it's really uh, uh, gut-wrenching too when you see kids dying, and when you see, um, you know, 13, 14, 15-year-old kids dying because nobody ever took the time to point out to them the hazards uh, that they're, they're asked to work with and stuff. And so we're trying to do a better job of some of that kind of stuff as well.